position. Yeah, very good. No, no, that's not the magic word. No? What's the magic word? Action! Very good. You come from a school which is well known for cinemas, remember. So, I want to welcome you to the uh, seminar of the Sony Astani Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. This is the first seminar of the academic year 09-010. Uh, so, uh, and so we are very pleased as the first seminar to welcome uh, Jose Borrero, uh, one of our alumni. Jorge, uh, Jose got his doctorate from USC in 2002, right? Stayed with us a few years uh, and worked as a postdoc or research associate with Dr. Costas Sinolakis, and then moved on to New Zealand. He, he, he switched hemisphere and went to the, uh, the beach on New Zealand in a place called Raglan. Uh, if you don't know where it is, it's about uh, two hours north south. or south, that's right. When you think, yeah, you have to reverse everything when you are looking at New Zealand. It's two hours south of Auckland, which is the capital of New Zealand, right? No, that's quite, that's Wellington. Boy, okay. <laughs> and worse things, I'm just being recorded. All right. So it shows that my knowledge of geography is not that great. Uh, Jose has been working on hydrodynamic modeling and did a lot of work on tsunamis with uh, Dr. Sinolakis. And now he's working on shore protection. So he, he has evolved toward coastal engineering. And he's going to tell us about how he actually manufactures these artificial reefs to control surf so you can have better surfing waves. And also you can control erosions on coastal areas. So it's a great pleasure to have Jose. Jose, the floor is yours. Yes. All right, can you hear me? Well, thanks. It's good to be here. It's been, a, been quite a while since I've been uh, back to USC for some sort of formal, uh, formal anything. Anyway, so uh, as you said, I, I'm living now in New Zealand, uh, work for the company called ASR Limited, and we are a consulting firm in New Zealand specializing in hydrodynamics and numerical modeling. And now we are branching into construction and sort of our, our uh, focus is erosion control and developing novel ways to deal with coastal erosion problems. And, uh, but of course we work in all, so all sorts of things, anything to do with hydrodynamics. So we uh, do port and harbor modeling, uh, coastal hazards, uh, mixing, uh, effluent problems, uh, lots of different things. So it's a broad base of things, but today I'll be talking about sort of our, our forte, which is this design and construction of submerged offshore structures and how they can be used for beach protection and improving recreational amenity. Uh, talk a bit about the design considerations, which, you know, things like the low, what you have to consider when you're looking at a design for one of these projects, which are things like the local oceanographic conditions, the wave climate, tide range, winds and currents, and of course sediment transport and how you're going to be modifying this. Uh, what are the recreational and operational parameters that you want to eventually get to? So what would be the surfability of this structure? Would you actually be able to make a wave that's rideable? Uh, what sort of wave dissipation and dis uh, breaking of the wave energy do you have before it reaches the coast? How much budget do you have to work with? And what are the structural conditions, sort of the uh, stability of the individual units, things like settlement and scour that can be produced as a result of these structures? The overall objective with these types of structures is to exploit the natural formation of a salient. A salient forms in the lee of an offshore structure. It's a, it's a ubiquitous feature that you see. You build something offshore, you get what's called a salient response, which is this uh, build out of the shoreline. You have a, a sediment flows down the coast, a breakwater or some structure offshore 
breaks down or reduces the wave energy that reduces the longshore sediment flux and then sediments can be deposited and you get a formation of a, of a salient. In extreme cases, uh, a tombolo forms which breaks the flow and that actually acts as a barrier and can be, be problematic causing a buildup on one side and erosion on the downstream side. So just a quick word about salients. Uh, salients happen naturally. You can see them around the world. You take your Google Earth and fly around and uh, look for them. They're everywhere. Uh, find offshore reefs. You can see a bump in the coastline behind it. So that's a natural salient. Salients happen unnaturally. And these are some examples from the Mediterranean coast of Spain where we have a, a submerged offshore structure here, a semi-submerged structure that formed a salient. And then just down the coast, these are actually just a few uh, kilometers apart. Uh, you have tombolo formation. So these are the end members of, of the salient response. So uh, tombolos can be bad. As you can see, one tombolo makes, uh, necessitates another, uh, whereas a, a submerged reef or a submerged structure can uh, create a, a, a feature that allows sediment to pass. Salients can also happen unintentionally. Uh, we found an example in India where we noticed this uh, feature along the coastline. Uh, there's a bulge there, a little salient. And if you look closely, you zoom in on the picture, you see that there is a sunken uh, ship sitting offshore. And it's, uh, the ship is about 192, 200 meter long ship. And it sits about offshore, about, uh, it, about 200 meters offshore. And it caused this small uh, bump in the coastline. So salience happen everywhere. They, and we're just looking at ways to sort of uh, exploit this natural occurrence. One thing you might not n realize here in California that uh, Santa Monica Beach is itself a giant salient or is a result of a giant salient. This picture is from 1940. The Santa Monica Breakwater, which is still sort of there if you go to the beach in Santa Monica, was built in 1933. In seven years time, this huge salient feature formed offshore uh, on, the, on the beach there. The green line shows the original uh, shore position and over time, if you look at the beach now, we've actually filled out past that uh, salient. So the, what we see as our beach, our natural beach in Santa Monica, is really a, a man-made filled-in uh, beach that they filled out to the apex of the salient that was caused by the Santa Monica breakwater. The remains of the breakwater are still out there, and it's just an example of how our perceptions have changed over time. What we see now is the natural beach really is a big artificial beach that was there thanks to a man-made structure put in in 1933. Uh, looking at the Santa Monica Bay beaches today, these are pictures taken uh, as we, I took off from Los Angeles a, a few months ago. You can see that this dominant sand flow is from the north to the south. This is the El Segundo uh, jetty here. Hyperion's treatment plant is here and the sand flow is normally is north to south dominantly. But if you look at Marina del Rey, you see that there is evidence of a bit of northerly transport as well. And that comes from the southerly swells that come in. But the strongest, most energetic things happen in the wintertime with the northward directed swells. Um, there's the Santa Monica Pier and the Santa Monica Salient, which has now been filled out. So it's now the Santa Monica Beach. And in Venice, this is uh, the Venice breakwater, there's a tombolo. So they, they put this breakwater in, the beach filled in and welded to the breakwater, and now it's a, a blocking feature, and it's uh, the Venice tombolo. So what is the formation mechanism for a salient? I'm just showing this. This is a, sort of the paper that de defined it the best from a group of guys in Australia. And they sort of, uh, they looked at a the shoreline response to a number of different structures. This was sort of one of their tables from the paper. Uh, I will be talking about a reef that our company designed several years ago and how if you look through his examples, it's one of the ones that has sort of the best response in terms of shoreline protection of what has been uh, attempted so far. A lot of these, you see that they have erosion behind them, so that means that the coastal protection uh, benefits were not realized, that the, the design wasn't done properly or not carried out. The, uh, so originally it was designed to have accretion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the fundamental result from there, uh, th and this has been actually shown by a number of different researchers, the fundamental result was that a four cell circulation pattern forms in the lee of a coastal structure. And when you, you get this four cell pattern, they showed it here both numerically and in physical models, 
whenever you can get that return flow circulation pattern, you have an, a buildup of the, of the beach in the lee of the structure. And th th getting this type of pattern depends on where you place the reef offshore. So it's a, it's a trade-off between looking at the wave conditions and the distance offshore and the amount of uh, budget you have for volume. Because as you move structures offshore, of course, they get bigger, which means they get more expensive. Moving a structure too close to shore leads to the, leads to the effect where you get uh, actually an erosive effect because the nearshore currents are accelerated. You get wave-induced uh, setup behind the structure. Then you cause a net current flow out to the sides, and then that causes erosion. So the design process has to be governed by looking at the wave climate and the size of the structure and determining the optimum placement for this type of structure. Now, you can build these things as you know, any number of different ways. We've been looking at a number of uh, different ways to do it. What we've come to is uh, using sand-filled geotextile containers, very large geotextile containers. These things are about uh, anywhere from 20 to 60 meters long with uh, five to uh, heights of two to five meters, um, cross-sectional areas that are huge. Uh, so things like 300 cubic meters per container. Um, and they can be cheaper than traditional construction with rock or rubble mound. And you can get uh, an accurate design shape, which for a recreational amenity is, is very important because uh, other structures that are built are built in a rubble mound fashion where sort of the details of the construction aren't as Im important. Um, so things can also be extended or modified in time. And, uh, it's a safer product or a safer configuration than, say, large boulders in the surf zone. If, uh, you may have been aware a few weeks ago there was a very large uh, swell that hit California and a, a body surfer was killed at the Newport Wedge, which if you put this all sort of in context, the uh, Newport uh, Jetty is an artificial man-made structure that people now use for recreational purposes, and it actually resulted in this guy being uh, injured and, and killed. So I'll talk about several structures now, sort of the history of them. Um, going from Australia through on the east coast of Australia, the west coast of Australia, one that was attempted here in California, and it's actually how I got involved with the topic, and uh, then uh, a construction that, ha that was undertaken in New Zealand, and a recently completed project in England. And then I will uh, also talk briefly about something that we had nothing to do with, but it's an, an example of this type of structure that was done in Florida. And there's many more examples around the world of, these, of uh, this type of structure. Looking at the size comparison, these are four of the reefs that I talked about um, in different places. The, all of these images are scaled the same um, to show that the, this is the narrow neck reef in on the east coast of Australia. The Cables Reef was uh, built on the e west coast of Australia. Then the Mount Reef in New Zealand and Pratt's Reef, which was the one that was built here in Southern California. And you see the, vari the variation in the design footprint, the overall magnitude of these things, and their offshore distance. So starting first with uh, on the east coast of New Zealand, um, this project was the one that was uh, primarily for erosion control and uh, beach protection, whereas the other structures that I talked about are, were made for recreational purposes with a secondary component that could be for the beach protection or a demonstration of beach protection uh, effects. However, this one, its primary goal was to stabilize a beach nourishment program that had been put in place on the east coast of Australia. Here they get a very strong dominant southerly current that wave-driven current that pushes huge volumes of sediment up the coastline, something like 200,000 meters, cubic meters per year, move up that coastline. It gets big waves, uh, it, can be, uh, it can be flat, but then it can also get large cyclone swells, and uh, they needed to find a way to sort of reduce the erosion at this place called Narrow Neck, because it, it's called Narrow Neck because it is the narrowest uh, part of the barrier island. It, it has been breached several times in the past. There's some big condominiums there, and they wanted to find a way to, to, to protect this section of the coast without building a giant jetty or, uh, or, or breakwater there. This was the proposed design here, and this is the, the scale of it. This is 50 meters, so this is a very big structure, and each one of these is, is one geotextile container unit. 
go. Oh, there we go. The construction. Uh, the construction of this structure was done with uh, these large geotextile containers filled with sand. It was done in a split hull barge where the geotextile fabric was laid in there. It was pumped full of sand and brought into position and located with a GPS and dropped into position. I, the problem with this type of construction method, as you see here, is it's relatively inaccurate. You don't get perfect placement of the, of the bags. They can land in, in inopportune places that would put undue stress on the bag and cause a rupture. Uh, and also the biggest problem was that the reef could never be built to the design specifications because you couldn't get the crest elevation high enough. The draft of the vessel, because this vessel opens up and drops the bag out, the draft wouldn't allow for it to bring, come up to the one meter. We wanted it with one meter, about one meter of, uh, of depth at, at uh, low tide. So you couldn't get it to be that shallow. So as a result, actually the structure was never built to its final design specification. Nevertheless, uh, the salient and the beach protection uh, aspect has been realized. Um, it, perhaps it could have been greater if it was built all the way to its full design specifications. But uh, they've used time-lapse photography and video uh, monitoring of the coastline. And this, the two red lines here, the blue line is the, uh, is the normal beach location. This gray bar shows where the reef is along the beach. And the, the, the envelope defined by these red lines is sort of the position, the changing position of the shoreline in time. This is a time stack of eight years of instantaneous shoreline positions as determined from uh, Argus video, video imaging techniques. So what you see clearly is that you have, you do have a wider beach that corresponds to the center line of the reef location. At the, in conjunction with the installation of this reef was a huge uh, beach nourishment project. So they put in large volumes of sand. This sand has now been redistributed and it formed into this salient. You can see it there in that picture. And uh, the the municipality believes that it has uh, increased their interval between renourishment cycles, which in the case of uh, beach nourishment is a big deal because if you can increase that time, you're saving a lot on cost. Uh, beach nourishment is very expensive. Uh, in terms of recreation, the reef has been used uh, for surfing. Uh, when the swells are right, it is, it is a surfing break. It's not the best break uh, around, but people do use it nonetheless. and they're, uh, so it has had success in that respect too. Now uh, moving to New Zealand, there's the North Island of New Zealand. Uh, on the uh, Bay of Plenty coast, so that's that, that bay there is facing to the northeast, is called the Bay of Plenty. Uh, this was started as a sort of a student project by actually one of the founders of the company uh, ASR that I work for, Shaw Mead and uh, Carrie Black, they, they were, uh, Carrie, uh, Dr. Black was a professor at the University of Waikato, Shaw was his senior PhD student, and this was one of their uh, projects that they worked on, was sort of what would be the process necessary to build a uh, recreational structure in, in the surf zone. And they started it as a, uh, as sort of a, a conceptual thing, it, it gained some community support, and, and then ten, uh, a few years down the line it actually got was realized and they built this reef. So this reef is about 4,500 cubic meters of volume. It's this uh, deltaic shape. Uh, this is the apex pointing offshore. Each one of these is a, uh, is a geotextile container. Um, the length along here is about uh, 60 meters. And the construction now Learning from the, the narrow neck example, that it was really important to get a more accurate construction method. So the method that was devised was to lay out the bags on land on a uh, predefined mesh and then fold this system of geobags onto a barge. Then there's anchors placed into the seabed and the, uh, the bag units are attached to the anchors. The barge is pulled out. The bags are laid into place, and then you bring in the pumping system, which worked off of another barge, and pumped the bags full of sand. Uh, it seems easy, but it was actually very difficult to do. This was the first time this sort of construction has ever been attempted, uh, really, in, in the world. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, learning, and there were some mistakes made along the way. But eventually, it was uh, worked out. It took about three or four attempts and construction seasons before the reef was finally uh, m 
completed. Uh, now the reef is basically at its at its uh, final uh, final what it's going to its final shape. But um, there's still some work that could be done to top it up or change a few things. But um, the point was that it was uh, it, it was developing these really novel and unique construction methods. Um, the monitoring we've done on the reef over the over a period of uh, four years. Um, more than four years, is uh, looking at the different, uh, we've taken many surveys, uh, about 13 or 14 different bathymetric surveys over this time. Every couple of months we send guys out there and looking at things like the scour and the settlement. So you notice in these two uh, surveys that there's a, a scour feature. The, the land, the beach is on this side, the ocean is on that side, so the waves are coming in. And you see you do have the formation of a scour hole. Scour is a big problem in the marine environment. And how do you deal with it? How do you guard against it? How do you mitigate it? Um, and so we looked at the series of transects through the reef. Uh, these are the transects um, coming through the center line of the reef. These are the different surveys, surveys 1 through 13. And you see this formation of this scour hole. This is inshore and that's offshore. But you also see some buildup of the shoreline. But this scour feature has been steadily growing over time. We think now it's stabilized because now the reef's in its final uh, volume and final plan shape. So uh, hopefully this will stabilize. We have scour protection uh, mattresses and uh, containers on the inside of the structure to limit its uh, ability to, uh, to uh, settle even further. Um, we've also looked at, uh, at the settlement. So settlement can be a result of scour causing the structure to actually fall into the scour hole or the settlement can be from the sand within the container itself sort of realigning itself uh, and the container getting shorter and also the other mechanism is through the pure weight of the structure on the seabed causing it to sink. So looking at the overall settlement of the crest height for this particular uh, reef uh, I took the uh, highest point from each of these transects and plotted it over time and you see that the, the reef is, uh, has, been, has been steadily uh, settling over the four, three or so years and it's somewhere between 30 and 70 centimeters so far. Uh, again, we think this is, should be stabilizing and now this information is being used in future designs and uh, a more geotechnical analysis of, this, of the substrate so that we don't have these problems or it can be mitigated against. In terms of surfing, uh, the Mount Reef has, has had uh, some good, uh, good waves breaking on it. It doesn't work a whole lot, uh, unfortunately, because uh, a lot of it has to do with the wave climate of the region. It, that place probably gets the least amount of uh, swell in New Zealand. Uh, when it, waves do get in there, it can be quite good. Um, so the waves there are, are quite short period. The direction changes very rapidly and the storms tend to move across the uh, swell window very quickly. The other problem is, is that when the waves do get big, sometimes the waves actually break offshore of the reef and that's because of the very shallow seabed in this area. And uh, it would have been more ideal to have the reef positioned further offshore. However, uh, navigational constraints and other legal requirements sort of limited how far offshore the reef could be placed. Um, I'll talk really quickly about cables. This one is just a was sort of is, is a, a great example because it was it was built. Uh, it was one of the first reefs to be built. It was built purely for surfing. It um, it was this was in the west coast of Australia. So this is Perth, city of Perth. This is Rottnest Island on the on outside of Perth, and uh, this was from a group at the University of West Australia. They did this all in the in the late 90s and it was built in uh, 99 and uh, the material was, uh, I have granite boulders there but actually I found out later it's limestone boulders. This is all natural limestone features here and it's a pretty small volume, only 3,300 cubic meters. The big problem was where they put it. If you notice, they put it in the shadow of an island so the swell doesn't get in there very often and they chose this location for a couple of reasons. One was because it was close to a bus stop so that people could get there without driving and they're trying to work in th these angles and there was no beach there, it, things like that. So really didn't, they didn't choose the location based on optimal location. They just said, okay, let's put it here. Um, nevertheless, it has days. Um, these are waves breaking on it. Guys surf it pretty regularly. Of all the reefs out there, this is probably the most regularly surfed because it, it uh, when the swell comes in, it, it's pretty consistent. But it's a short ride and it's a small volume. It's only 3,000 cubic meters or so. So the most recent 
uh, reef to be built in the world is this one in, in Bournemouth, England, uh, the Boscombe Reef. And if you look where it is, it's up in the English Channel there. It's the red dot on the uh, south coast of England. So it's quite a ways up the English Channel. And you would think that not much swell gets up there. And, and you are correct in thinking that because not a lot of swell gets up there. So the design uh, was also very challenged by the fact that it was a small wave climate and, uh, and it's frequently quite windy there. Now the Bournemouth uh, Borough Council wanted to build something unique. They were they're re, they're putting uh, tens of millions of dollars into redeveloping the coastline there and br putting in new buildings and a new pier and, and doing all this stuff and they wanted to have something unique, a focal point. They thought the surfing reef idea would be good. So uh, we provided a design and construction for this reef. The construction was done over two uh, construction seasons and uh, and it was just completed this uh, actually about three weeks ago uh, and actually finalized. Now, to get an idea of the scale, these are kayakers here floating on top of the reef. The reef is a footprint. It's about the size of a soccer field. Its uh, total volume is something like 16,000 cubic meters of volume. So it's one of the bigger ones. Uh, narrow neck I showed earlier was actually 70,000 cubic meters. So this is still not quite as big as a narrow neck, but, um, but still it's a big structure. Um, and it was a challenge for the construction. Uh, that's what the 16,000 cubic meters of sand looks like on the beach. The construction method was a bit different from the, uh, what I described for the Mount Reef, whereas the Mount Reef, they took the sand to fill the geocontainers from the seabed right next to it. This one, we actually had the supply of sand placed on the beach and then had a shore-based uh, pumping system with a Venturi type pump. These are big pumps that suck water from the ocean. It gets mixed in here and then sand is dropped in through uh, into a hopper and then mixed and pumped out about 300 meters to the, to the geocontainers. Uh, ASR now runs a full construction crew and all of this equipment is fully mobile. It can be packed into a container. It's currently on the way to uh, India for another uh, construction project. And uh, we move the, con the containers and the material and the people around to build the structures where they're needed. It, should, it is pretty much the only, t only one of its type in the world. Um, so this is an example of the reef in construction. It's a two-layer structure. So you see you have bags going this way. Then you have another layer of bags on the top going this way. The wave direction is here. There's a bo boat for comparison. And there's the completed reef from the air. You can see these, these pictures were actually when only part of the reef was completed. Uh, guys are out there surfing on it uh, when, when there's a swell that, that warrants it. And uh, just we're waiting now for uh, some good swells to come through and for s some more uh, observational uh, confirmation of this, thing, of this thing breaking. The locals are really happy with it. So one of the things to think about is the stability of multi-layered geotextile structures. So multiple layers are, are sometimes necessary to achieve the required crest heights because you can't just make bigger and bigger geobags. So you might as well, there's a economically uh, the best size for a geotextile container in terms of how much they cost to produce and what sort of heights you can get from each one. So the stability uh, issues are rolling, sliding, and uplift from the wave forces. Uh, I worked with a... Uh, a guy, Juan Recio, who uh, works uh, with a company called ATM based in Dubai, and uh, we learned his method for uh, determining stability. Uh, and he used a numerical model approach to determine the wave forces and the uplift forces, and then defines the threshold based on the weight, the threshold for movement and threshold for stability, which is the weight of the structure and the resisting forces, which are the friction between the structural units, the, uh, the weight of it, the drag force, things like that. And uh, you see these are plots of uh, the uh, moving forces versus the, and the resisting stable line is here. So under certain conditions, the, that top container for this particular design, which is just one example, we showed that the, this container is actually unstable under extreme wave conditions. So we had, as a result, we had to go back, redesign the structure and increase the lengths and the widths and the volumes of all these pieces in order to make sure that it was stable under extreme wave loadings. So the next one is a sort of a disappointing study and failure, I guess, uh, is what happened here in Los Angeles. Oh, yeah. Can you please go back to the previous slide? Yeah. I can see that there are at some 
locations there are some spikes that go over that threshold. Yeah. But the duration is very small. I'm just wondering if in that small duration force can cause instability or not. Well, it's yeah, it's a you Probably it wouldn't, and I mean it, it just shows that the bag can move there, and when things move, then you can get stresses in the geotextile, and then that can cause a rupture of the geotextile container. Or if you just have gradual movement, say if you have a prolonged monsoon season, or a, this is actually for design in India. So you say you have a prolonged storm or series of storms, and you get a lot of incremental movements, and then over the years you have creep and uh, then things. So the idea is to keep it stable as much as possible. So even though it is short duration, it's, it still does something. It really builds up those stresses internally in the container, which can cause the container to rupture. And once a container ruptures, then you've lost that entire unit, which is, which is the problem. One of the problems with geotextiles is that it, they're massive units, but if one fails, it, it, it's, it's their stability is, is a requisite on them being a cohesive, gigantic, massive unit. So. Coming now to, to Los Angeles, this is uh, Pratt's Reef. This was uh, a project that was pretty much, that this was started by the Surfrider Foundation back in, uh, in the 80s. This uh, came about uh, in after the 82-83 El Nino, uh, when the, there's a lot of strong waves. The Chevron refinery is here. This is uh, El Segundo, California, so Manhattan Beach is that way. Marina Del Rey is that way. This is Hyperion sewage treatment plant here. The Chevron refinery is just off there. This is the, the jetty at the south end of El Segundo. There used to be a pier there, and in the El Nino winter of 1982-83, that pier was demolished, and Chevron, uh, and, and as a result of that pier being demolished, also the pipeline that goes, if you notice, if you go out to Manhattan Beach, oftentimes there's big tankers sitting out there. It's because there's a refinery on land, the tankers come in, they hook to these pipes, and they pump oil into the refinery. Those pipes became exposed during the winter, so Chevron needed uh, an emergency permit to build this groin and backfill the beach. And as a result, this place here, the Grand Street Jetty, which was a popular surfing area, was completely buried in sand. Um, the local people and uh, Surfrider, well, it was before the Surfrider Foundation actually existed, uh, they they sued Chevron and sued the state of California, trying to get um, a well, mitigation for the lost recreational amenity, which is a, uh, you know, has value. And the, uh, so the, the thing was, the, they found that, okay, yeah, Chevron was responsible, and they're going to mitigate it in the form of this new idea called the artificial reef. However, by the time the thing went through the courts and got it all, they ended up with about $200,000, which, if you ever looked at the cost of constructing things in the ocean, that will get you just about nothing. And that's what they got. So they used the money to try and build a structure, and it was a, not a very good uh, result. The structure, again, was only about 1,400 cubic meters, and actually it was recently completely dismantled. They took a crane out there and actually took out the remainder of all the, of all the bags. I got involved with this project as I heard about it because I was just interested in the idea, and I did a monitoring program to see you know, what was how did this structure behave? What were the responses? Did it create anything? And you know, how did it handle? So the construction method, because they were using these uh, small bags, they could be lifted into place with a crane and, and dropped in. Uh, the surfing aspect was uh, pretty dismal. If you notice here, this is the reef here. There's uh, some buoys there that show the location of the reef. Uh, almost the waves were not breaking on it at all. Whereas if you went just down the street, uh, one, you know, three miles away and you see the tanker in the background, the waves were quite good. These were uh, the same day, about a half hour apart, these photos. Uh, other examples, again, the reef never really did anything. This was, a, it was something like this, little crumbly things. It was built much too far into the, it was m built much too close to shore, much too small, and it was just, it suffered from uh, a really a bunch of different uh, things that were just not considered in the design. So why did it fail? And I say three things, improper design, improper location, and improper materials. So improper design, it was too close to the, to the beach. Its cross shore dimension, meaning this dimension here, relative to the incoming wavelengths was much too small, so the waves didn't even see it. Uh, and the project engineer should have known this. Uh, nobody did any real studies on this thing. Comparing Pratt's Reef to the Narrow Neck Reef, which I showed before, so you see the 
huge, huge disparity in their sizes. Improper location, it was too close to shore. Uh, basic coastal geomorphology was ignored. Uh, they put this reef in in the summertime, at the end of the summer, when if you know anything about beach dynamics, at the, at the end of the summer all the sand is up on the beach and then in the first storms of the winter it erodes that sand, pushes it offshore into a bar and then that sort of acts as a buffer for the rest of the winter until the small waves return and then that sand migrates up. They put the reef in when all the sand was up on the beach. The first storms came, swept all the sand out and completely buried the structure. So that was, uh, that was a complete uh, mess up. Uh, and also improper materials. So I, I put this in here to show sort of what are the scales of these things. Because a lot of times people just t say sandbags. You know, these are sandbags. Well, no, they're not sandbags. This is, this is how big the bags were in Pratt's Reef. This is a VW bus. This is a city bus. And this is the size of the geo containers used in the structures that we're designing and building now. So they're on completely different uh, orders of magnitude in terms of uh, size. Also, the materials were wrong in that the, uh, the type of geotextile they used was a woven geotextile. So rips, once a rip propagated, it would propagate through the material and, uh, and, and you see the sand coming out and the whole thing just basically fell apart. A um, few interesting things did happen though during some of the monitoring. So this is August 2002 and in one uh, scuba diving trip out there, I saw, you know, there's probably 300 lobster uh, crawling around on this thing. There was halibut, there was uh, mussels living on it, you know, so it, it really showed that in, in animals are attracted to these structures. As soon as you put something hard out there, animals come to it. And that's one of the key components of a multipurpose structure is that you can enhance the ecology, add to the uh, recreational amenity, and provide some sort of coastal protection all in one, you know, co uh, one uh, unified product. Uh, so ironically though, there is this, uh, artificial reef, it's not really an artificial reef, it's the one mile outfall from uh, the Hyperion sewage treatment plant, it's the old outfall, it's not the currently used outfall which is a five mile long structure that's actually underground, but this is out there and uh, you know at times this actually serves as an artificial reef which is the sort of the most ironic thing that you know the attempt to put an artificial reef here completely failed but this one's been sitting here since 1925 and uh, nobody really uh, notices it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, looking at scales, that's another uh, factor with these. Uh, the reefs I've talked about are tiny. All of them are tiny. 3,000 cubic meters, even 70,000 is tiny. Uh, and now Boscom at 16,000. If you think about the Long Beach breakwater, there's 1,200 cubic meters in each meter of the breakwater. So, you know, at 4,000 meters long, you've got something like, you know, 4.8 cubic million, 4.8 million cubic meters in just the Long Beach segment, and 15.3 cubic million cubic meters in the entire thing. So, when you're thinking about a coastal structure, think of its total volume. And what we're, what we've been able to accomplish so far is very tiny. We're hoping to get bigger, but it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it's expensive and uh, a long process to sort of change the way uh, coastal structures are built and designed. Uh, you know, looking also at the Newport uh, jetties. Now, uh, if you want to compare recreation to uh, recreational uses of structures, you could argue that these types of structures are, are uh, while they were navigational at the beginning, now they're pretty much for recreation. It, it keeps a harbor open that's used by recreational boaters. And this is, you know, 200,000 cubic meters of material. It uh, is a home to a world famous surfing spot. Uh, nobody bats an eye on it, but then when you try and propose uh, another type of structure to do a similar type of thing, it seems to hit all of this uh, resistance and, uh, and uh, second guessing of the whole idea. So, you know, if multipurpose reefs were ever allowed to be built at the same scales as other traditional coastal engineering structures, there would be a lot more success. Where's the wedge? Oh, the wedge is uh, right here. It's, it's right off the edge of this. It comes in that way. And... Uh, so, you know, is there a multipurpose reef in America's future? Possibly. Um, slowly, the engineering objectives are changing in, in response to public demand. Public wants more uh, consideration for the recreational amenity of their beaches. They don't want uh, seawalls because uh, that doesn't add, actually protect the beach, it protects the land. Uh, so recreational amenities are being considered. However, the regulatory climate is still very difficult and costly to navigate. And that's you know not going to change anytime soon. 
And the irony, again, another irony, is that reef-like things continue to get permitted and built. This is an example from the north uh, end of Florida, uh, near Jacksonville, Florida. This is uh, Amelia Island, and it's a, what they, the designers of this structure called it a leaky shore parallel breakwater. And why do they call it leaky? Well, leaky refers to the intentional design characteristic to minimize the level of wave dissipation. So they want to allow a certain fraction of the wave energy over, the, over their structure. So they built the crest height low, high tides and storm surge over top. The spacing between the rock units is big, so there's a lot of transmission of wave energy. Nevertheless, the salient response is still there. It was done to anchor a huge uh, beach nourishment program. There was two structures, this and this uh, terminal groin here. Both were designed as leaky structures. You know, and you can accomplish leakiness in, in at least two ways. One is making the space between the uh, structures big or by reducing your crest height and allowing wave energy to come over the top. So my question is, why couldn't something like this be built this way and maybe you could do something else with it, surf on it and still get your, your your end result, which is a, a structure that provides the, the shoreline anchoring and a, you get the few extra amenities at a marginal extra cost. Um, and if things start looking expensive, I always like to put this in here. So uh, a few years ago, we, uh, we apparently put in $39 million to build an elephant exhibit at the LA Zoo. And $39 million for three elephants versus, you know, we can't even get $200,000 to build a, a surfing reef. How many surfers are there? How many elephant watchers are there? How many beachgoers are there? You could make that argument in a lot of different, uh, in a lot of different ways. So uh, to date, um, only five multipurpose uh, or artificial surfing reefs have been attempted. The three that were built after a rigorous design process have performed as expected in terms of the surfing and the shoreline response. One structure, the Pratt's Reef, was a complete failure and has been dismantled. The Boscombe Reef, which has been uh, recently completed, is, uh, is still sort of uh, awaiting its, uh, for its trial run. Um, and multipurpose or artificial reefs are a viable option for, for erosion problems. It's just, there's many ways you can solve a problem. This is just, nothing should be rejected out of hand. This is just one aspect of a multifaceted approach to coastal management. And also, if we want to go purely recreational, these things can be built at a reasonable cost and it's comparable to other forms of uh, municipal expenditures on public recreation. Things like, you know, golf courses, basketball courts, uh, even, or if you look at ski fields, you know, huge expense and huge money in that. But the sort of the mental discontinuity happens between, say, a ski field and a beach is that, you know, at a ski field, they charge you $75 to use those lifts. And at the beach, you're not allowed to charge people. So, and I don't say we should charge people, but we should also think of what are these uh, sort of extra aspects you get from a group of people using a beach and coming for a particular purpose. So that's my uh, talk today. And uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd we got a few minutes. The yeah, the uh, they had some money in their budget set aside for that purpose, and the Surfrider Foundation they had it left over, and they and uh, there that's actually become a an issue too. There, you know. Uh, what it cost to take it out, and uh, my argument was they should have left it in. I and I, they, I think they should have left it in because it was basically under the sand level, and it wasn't. Nobody goes there, and and it was completely benign, not doing anything, and taking it out actually brought more negative publicity on themselves. And I would have just let sleeping dogs lie and 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 not worried about it. Yeah. 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 Well, and but those those critters were probably gone by then anyway because the sand level came up, or they. I mean, actually, the bags scoured into the into the sand, so that aspect of it wasn't there anymore. But uh, but yeah, for that short little window of time, it you know provided refuge for a bunch of lobsters that were on their way down the coast wherever they were going. What is the design life? Uh, the geotextiles are guaranteed for about 20 years, and there's there are uh, examples of them that have been in service for more than 30 years. You know, the geotextile industry is only 20, 30, or about 30 years old, really, 30-ish years, 
And so there's examples that are still in service. Uh, we anticipate that stuff put in the water now, 50 years minimum. Martin? Like for the nourishment yeah. of the beaches. The oh, well, oh, okay. Well, if they're in the bags, they're not moving. They're. Yeah, but they're still if they're from the local area. The heavier ones, it would make a difference. Um. Oh, I don't know. What you mean like the the gross weight of the bag is is going to be well? It's the density of the of the individual grains that determines the gross. You get a higher density than what's right around that area. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so then we do look at you know we we source our sand. Trying to, you also want to keep a match with the local sand too, in case they have to be broken open. But but then the other thing is that these volumes really are small at, for now. I mean, if we get into much larger and larger structures, that could be an issue. But when you're saying mixing in, say, 5,000 cubic meters of stuff with the net shoreline m movement in an area, you know, it's it's nothing. So you can put whatever you want in there. Um, the issue you don't want bigger grain. You don't. You, there's a limit to how big your grain sizes are because that inhibits your pumping capacity. And so it, it's a trade-off with how far you have to pump to fill that thing. So if you have really, we had that problem in one project where we had a quarry-derived sand rather than river sand or uh, beach sand. And since it was irregularly shaped with a lot of variable grain sizes, uh, our the pumping system would get clogged up, and we had to actually uh, abandon that project and that process because of that. It was just it was killing the the job. It couldn't be accomplished. Now we're revisiting that job and trying to do it with a different set of uh, uh, sand characteristics. But this first set, it was uh, anywhere from you know one millimeter to four millimeter grains, big heavy grains, and it was uh, quarry crushed sand. So it had a regular shape, and and your energy requirements to pump that stuff was uh, was huge. For the waves. the waves, well, no, it's um, of course n not always, but on a on a straight and parallel. If you have a beach that has basically straight and parallel contours, by the time you get that far in, your wave crests have started to align with the contours by then. But there is sort of a, an overall, uh, there will be a directional component to it. So actually, we've incorporated in some of our proposals uh, a, a factor that. Uh, encourages refraction against the dominant longshore current. So if you say Huntington Beach, where the swell is coming from the south, you can put in a structure that as it refracts, it causes refraction to go this way, and then you get a zone where you have a sort of a counter current to your dominant southerly current, and that will help to reduce your longshore current at that area, encourage sand deposition, and the formation of the salient. And that's called wave rotation. It's uh, been discussed by a lot of different authors. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's something that can be done. It hasn't been really demonstrated in, in uh, practice yet because n we haven't had the opportunity to build one. Lay? Yeah, it's um, it's probably best. Well, you know, you have to look at the sediment dynamics of the area. If if you don't have any input of sediment there, sticking a reef in is not going to bring the sand back. So it will, of course, uh, in those situations, you might be in conjunction with a renourishment program, and then the idea would be to increase the longevity of that renourishment program. So you increase your renourishment interval, and uh, and then you know that brings down the capital cost for that community that has to do that. Yeah. So it requires that we have to um, contribute into the uh, beach nourish. Yeah. And the problem is that one way of the nourish beach is tend to erode faster than the natural beach. Yeah. So we hit constantly. And you, you mentioned that we shorten the duration, then it would be better. But it's very expensive. It's, I, it's minimum about a million per month per mile. Yeah, yeah. Beach. It's super expensive. So now it's Of the constant maintenance, 
And one of the issues we have is that you had to bring in the sand that's similar with the native beach. Yeah. And for the example of some beach, we, we could not find that the sand. So yeah. there are two issues here. One is that the location itself, even without the port, is already don't have the capacity of natural, um, um, what we call them, in, 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 what is that? No, I mean when it washed by the stone, it gradually by a small wave it will return back to yeah. the port. Naturally, we recover it. So some of the ports, that if they have a natural recovery and we have the port there, so we can kind of, of um, calculating the impact by the port and then we can contribute the compensation. But in some cases, we the the beach itself can don't have that capacity. Yeah, yeah. So if you're sediment starved. Right. Yeah. So we we lack of sand. Yeah. Now, Yeah, that, that, that's, yeah. In terms of materials to construct the break water, do anything specially that you could suggest that could either come from kind of slow downs or supporting the, the, the erosion? Yeah, well, yeah, I don't, you know, what, when you're doing the stuff for the port itself, you, you need to completely knock out all your wave energy. So you're going to have to build something with a high, you know, crest height that no overtopping occurs and it's very stable and, and so this, you, you don't, you of course wouldn't use a submerged structure or something that allows wave energy to pass over. So, you know, for the port itself, you know, probably not. Uh, um, they've looked into, uh, there, there are papers on using a geotextile core with a rock rubble outer outer uh, skin for, for breakwaters. The problem with that is, is, is it's a bit more expensive and the uh, transmissivity of the, of the long wave energy is, is, is really, re is, uh, really uh, low. So it blocks all the, wave energy, uh, all the long wave energy so you don't get the tide, uh, the tide going through. So the, the porosity is, is a lot lower than on a, you know, a rubble mound structure with a, with a, co a gravel fill. You know. And sometimes you want long wave energy to pass through um, yeah, and, and, in, and then also the stability of uh, putting like dolos units or big, uh, you know, 20 ton rocks on top of a geotextile core is actually less stable than building a, a, you know, small gravel or not gravel, but small boulder core with the, with the big units on top. That's more stable because of the interlocking between the units. When you've got that sharp interface between the geotextiles and the outer skin of rocks, you actually are creating a more unstable situation. And so your costs go up. And so it's probably not the most cost effective way to do it. In terms of, you know, it's more something that could be used in conjunction with the port. So you've got a port here that blocks your sediment flow. This port's been here for generations. It's not going anywhere. This side of the uh, area has a huge problem with uh, erosion. So you've got to get a bypassing system. And then if you had a system of reefs here to sort of reduce the longshore flux, then you could reduce the interval with which you need to move material from one side to the other, which could reduce your long-term cost, you know, if you're looking 20, 30 years into the future. Yeah. From the experience on the beach nourishment, which is also fun, or it's some sort of continuing contribution by the, the port, for example. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I don't think there's been a pro, there's been, hasn't been really, I mean, it's a piecemeal approach all through the U.S. for where the Not beach nourishment, US, yeah, international, yeah, yeah. Thank you. While I look at the clock, it's now time to conclude our seminars, but before we do that, I'd like again to thank Jose for an interesting seminar. Thank you. Thanks.